wonderful to be here with y'all. Um, uh, uh, I'll, I'll talk about this more in a moment, but you know, part of the Vanta's early days was going through YC and um, you know, YC aside, I think there's just a ton of value to like meeting other startups at your stage and like learning some startup best practices. So super excited to support Founder University and what y'all are doing. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen. Uh, I've got a handful of slides, so one moment. Great. Okay. And you all can see you all can see the slides. Sure can. Okay, wonderful. Well, I will get started then. Um, so mentioned, but just briefly, my name is Christina Cassiopo. Uh, I'm the CEO and co-founder of Vanta. Uh, Vanta helps startups improve their security and then get through compliance audits like SOC 2, ISO 2701, HIPAA, GDPR, et cetera. Um, and we do that in weeks rather than months with a lot of automation. So we started doing this three years ago um, and excited to talk to you about it. Um, but starting at the very beginning, um, the idea for Vanta came like so many do uh, out of experiencing the need for the product myself. Um, so in 2016, which basically feels like the dark ages at this point, um, but I was leading the Dropbox paper PM team and we'd been advised to act like a startup within Dropbox. Um, so we were moving fast and breaking things and working sort of around the clock to bring paper to market. Uh, and we thought we were going to be bigger than Dropbox. So we were like very, you know, pleased with ourselves, um, but we didn't have any users yet. And so we were going to start by giving paper, this brand new product, to all the Dropbox users. Um, and that was the plan. Uh, it's how we were going to get bigger than Dropbox. Uh, but right before we did that, we hit this roadblock. Um, and that in our efforts to move fast, we realized that we hadn't built paper to conform to Dropbox's security or compliance standards. Um, and so part of that was realizing, thanks to the legal team and some wonderful lawyers, um, that we had to go back and get paper to be SOC 2 compliant. Uh, learn that process would take up to a year, take most of the engineering time, uh, uh, engineering time and team. Um, and this was all in an effort to prove that paper was secure and reliable. Um, and you know, this was Dropbox again in 2016 at the height of the height of Dropbox's powers. And at the same time as you know, we were you know struggling to, to get paper to market, uh, there were just a bunch of high profile data breaches. Um, you know, this was 2016 election and everyone's emails everywhere, it was Equifax and uh, like social security numbers everywhere. Uh, and it just kind of became clear to me that security wasn't something you could put off until you were a big company um, uh, or until, you know, your company was this attractive target. Like it really had become table stakes for like anyone building a B2B product. Uh, so about, you know, a year later in 2017, I co-founded Vanta um, with the idea that uh, if you can help companies uh, think about and prioritize security early on, you can later help them sort of unlock deals, level the playing field and really grow their businesses um, at the same time as keeping them secure uh, in the process. So that's a little bit of the origin story. And then by the end of 2020, uh, Vanta had surpassed $10 million in ARR, well, sexual and ARR chart, uh, just with numbers removed. Um, uh, and we'd helped kind of almost a thousand customers improve their security. Uh, and we did all this without raising a series A. But uh, at the time, you know, we had this huge market pull. We saw this huge opportunity in front of us and, you know, we wanted to go take it. It felt like this market we had created was something that was very much real and felt. Um, and so we, in, in May of 2021, decided to raise a series A. We did that uh, $50 million from Sequoia. Um, and that decision to, to wait until we'd passed $10 million in ARR uh, was uh, not something that happened accidentally, right? Usually when you're at $10 million of ARR, you're raising a series B, you've already done the series A, all of that. Um, and we didn't take that path. Um, and it was both purposeful, but it also wasn't the original plan. Um, Specifically, when I mentioned we went through YC, so when Vanta exited Y Combinator in the spring of 2018, uh, we sort of felt like we were uh, on top of the world. We just hit our revenue targets. We'd raise this round, um, and we were going to go do the standard startup thing of like sell our product for 
um, to make a million dollars in ARR and get a series A and then 10 million for a series B and, and all of that. Uh, we're sort of like, you know, on top of the world. Uh, in fact, like so on top of the world that we thought we could, uh, and in fact did um, pause sales so that uh, we could, you know, just focus on recruiting because at the time it was just two founders. Um, so that's sort of what we were doing. And then, you know, but nine months after that, call it like late 2018, um, a YC partner pulled me into their office and said we were behind. Um, that, you know, nine months after YC, most other companies had a million dollars in ARR. For context, we probably had about 150, 200K. Um, and so our batch mates were, you know, driving up and down Sand Hill Road, collecting term sheets. And here we, you know, we thought we were doing great, but in fact, um, uh, very much off track. So uh, I left that meeting uh, really freaked out, probably appropriately freaked out, which I think was that partner's goal, uh, which they very much succeeded in. Um, but I was also resolute about one thing from that, and that was I didn't want the arbitrary timeline of raising money to be something that I obsessed over. Uh, nor did I want to, at that point, walk into a VC's office um, and pitch Vanta without the full confidence that you know the product, the team, the idea deserved. So uh, I didn't build slides, um, but instead of that slide building uh, and you know driving up and down Sand Hill, because remember this was pre-COVID, um, I devoted much more of my time to talking to customers, selling the product, and ultimately growing my own conviction that we were solving an important problem in an important way that you know was huge and massive and we could grow from. Um, and so six, so started doing these things. Six months later, uh, Vanta did in fact hit that magical million dollars in ARR. Um, and so we did that and sort of revisited the question of fundraising again. And when we did that, something in me I noticed had shifted. Um, I was more clear eyed about the problems that money could and couldn't solve. Um, you know, money can solve some, but certainly not others. Uh, I also realized that if we kind of kept this focus, you know, customer centric, selling the product, um, building the business as it were, we could get a lot further. Uh, and the external validation from venture capitalists is really nice and it, you know, kind of gives everyone a boost, but fundamentally it's, it's about the business we were building and building our own conviction in that. Um, so all of that aside, I do want to stop and say, this is not a talk about how you should not raise money or how VCs are bad. Um, I literally started my career at an early stage venture firm. I very much like the people I worked for. Um, this is not about like, oh, you know, I think you shouldn't raise money. Uh, that's not the point. Um, but the point is that waiting to raise for us and working within the constraints of our balance sheet had a lot of benefits uh, for Vanta early on specifically. Um, we had to rely on organic word of mouth uh, to spread the product. We just didn't either have, you know, money for marketing or a marketing team. Um, and that ended up being a really good barometer of product market fit, uh, just like the internal referrals from, you know, existing customers, et cetera. Um, we had to be disciplined about spending um, across all parts of the company. You know, company was somewhere between call it 10 and 30 people through a lot of this stage. Um, and we just couldn't, you know, spend money like a Dropbox would because we, you know, literally only had a couple million dollars in the bank account. Um, and most importantly, we had to rely on our own internal calibration of whether we were building a good business. So we couldn't be like, oh, you know, this, this you know, impressive VC thinks we have a good business, therefore we're doing a good job. Um, it was much more about, you know, us looking at what we were doing and our results and thinking we were doing a good job. Um, and I'm a huge believer in this approach. So today, uh, having gone through it, um, I have four lessons to share, uh, some of which are all of which I hope will be helpful to you, whether you're building a you know, venture-backed rocket ship um, or just a proper cash flow positive business. So to start with lesson number one, uh, the market always wins, AKA build something people want. So if you're starting a company, uh, you probably have good intuition that people want your product, um, but validating that someone will actually buy it before you spend a bunch of time building it, uh, turns out to be a lot harder and also tremendously valuable. 
And for Vanta in particular, uh, this piece, validating that people wanted what we were building before we spent a bunch of time building it was really important to me because prior in my career, I'd spent a lot of time building things that no one wanted. <laughs> um, so the way we went about the validation uh, was first uh, speaking to a ton of founders and realizing that there are two key purchase triggers for security products. The first was closing deals. Um, like I experienced at Dropbox, proving security had become table stakes for anyone building a B2B or an enterprise company. Um, and I talked to a lot of CEOs and CTOs who spent untold hours filling out security questionnaires or manually taking screenshots for these audits, sort of at the 11th hour, because they really wanted to close a new, often large customer. And sort of the, the abstracted point here is that, you know, if you're trying to sell to a big company, Google, Slack, whomever, um, and they tell you to, you know, jump six feet in the air, like you're going to jump six and a half, seven feet in the air, like you will do what they ask you to do when you are a startup. And that's fine, but like that is just a reality. The second purchase trigger uh, was uh, that just folks are like rightfully anxious about security. Um, it's a topic that falls into this like low knowledge, high anxiety gap where, uh, you know, you just, you worry a lot about it. You don't quite know what to do. In some cases, bring on these expensive security consultants who in some cases help and in some cases are just expensive. Um, but, you know, more often than not, we found founders just sort of lost sleep over it and they're like something bad could happen. It would be business ending, but uh, I don't know that for sure. And so they'd, you know, kind of just lose sleep over it. Um, and so these conversations helped validate for me that there was a lot of motivation for folks to buy a product that made getting secure faster and more automated and reliable, uh, especially for small startup teams. Um, we just had to figure out what that product was, right? So good value prop, but like what, what that product is. So we went back a little bit to the Dropbox days um, and knew that SOC 2 certifications were, were sorted by many to be the common app for security. So uh, sort of like one thing you fill out, um, and if you remember this from applying to college, and then you can go send it to multiple companies, right? Like that's kind of what SOC 2 was. Every enterprise knew what it was and would accept it. Um, and so you can sort of realize that, man, if we could make getting a SOC 2 fast and automated and less painful, uh, we would have a lot of willing customers. Um, so that was, we felt good about the SOC 2 piece, but then we didn't start building yet. Uh, even after this, we wanted to validate that we truly understood what a SOC 2 was. Um, and then once we understood that, that it was possible to take this lengthy and jargon-filled questionnaire and break it down into its component pieces that could be coded and automated. And so what we did here, thankfully, was we had friends at Segment. Um, oops, yep, here we go. We had friends at Segment who were about to embark on their first compliance certification. Um, and we managed to convince the team that we could help them get ready uh, for free. Um, uh, they graciously gave us desks in their office um, and, and they had actually just moved into a brand new office. So it was one of those things where you walk in and you know, a like the team is huddled on like, you know, one corner and then, you know, two thirds of the office is, office is empty. Um, so we sat, you know, in the empty two thirds and ate a bunch of their chocolate covered pretzels and honestly just read a bunch of stock two reports, um, trying to figure out like what the compliance speak said, parsing that, turning it into engineering speak. Um, literally probably read uh, two dozen SOC two reports that week and, you know, ate uncountably many uh, chocolate pretzels. Um, but what came out of that was like literally this spreadsheet, uh, this exercise, uh, this is a spreadsheet of, you know, each of the SOC 2 controls and a green yellow status for each. Um, and then we said, look, you know, once everything here is green, uh, you'll pass your SOC 2 audit. Uh, this is your directions to get ready. It's how, what you can give to the auditor to check, like this will take you through it. Um, and this is literally Vanta V0, um, all in the spreadsheet. Um, and so we handed the spreadsheet over to Segment, uh, and then we asked them three questions uh, about it. Uh, first one, what did I give you? Like, what is the spreadsheet? Two, would you use it? Like, is it actually helpful? Three, how much would you pay for it? 
that was it. Um, I would encourage you to one, ask these questions of your customers or prospects. Um, and two, if they can't answer them, particularly the first two, uh, like go back and keep iterating on what you're building. And we realized that, you know, even though our product was just this color-coded spreadsheet, we were on the right track. Um, and it helped us kind of prove out a few things uh, that we could like engineerify a SOC 2. So take these like really long jargon lead in reports, turn them into something digestible and, and ultimately automatable. Uh, second, that people understood what we were building. So, you know, we asked segment what, what we gave them. They said the words we thought we would say. Um, uh, I know that sounds simple, but um, I've built many things in the past where that was not true. So this was like truly a win. Um, and then third, and most importantly, they'd pay for it because uh, the security problems that they felt were so acute. Um, so that's the first lesson, uh, build something people want. I think, you know, the broader point, no matter how much buzz you raise, your money you raise or buzz you generate, um, you simply can't raise your way into building the right product. Um, and especially if you're trying to build without taking on funding, uh, you just don't have as much time to iterate towards something that works. Um, and then if you do, you know, you don't have the right product, but you do raise, um, you know, yes, you have the bank account to maybe continue iterating, but uh, explaining that to your investors, explaining that to the employees you've hired all gets harder. Um, and so I just want to encourage you to take the time up front to validate that your MVP is on the right track. That's lesson one. Lesson two, charging annually up front makes everything better. So after you confirm that you're building a product people want, the second most important piece of scaling is to figure out how to sell and charge for your product. And one of the lessons I've learned via Vanta is that if you can, charging up front makes everything easier. When we first started selling Vanta, uh, I offered both annual and month-to-month -month contracts. This seemed like what every other SaaS company did. I didn't really have a reason to, to deviate. Um, and it seemed how customers wanted to buy. Um, and then uh, we brought on our first salesperson and he stopped selling month-to-month, -month, like basically on his second day, just like I'm only offering annual. Um, and I was, uh, quite concerned slash confused. Uh, don't think of myself as a salesperson. So we we're like going with it. Uh, figured he probably knew something I didn't, which was true. Um, specifically, like we were already kind of creating this new product and category for startups, the security automation concept and saying, hey, startup, you know, you should invest in this. And yes, if you'd been founded in, you know, 2014, you wouldn't think about this, but hey, given you're founded in 2019 or 2021, this is an important thing to invest in early. So we we're already doing that. Um, and then we were just kind of complicating things by adding a bunch of contract options. Uh, and almost literally, we built this product that was meant to relieve anxiety, but then we're like introducing all these other options and you know vectors for anxiety and, and how you should buy it. Um, so our salesperson kept quoting just annual pricing. People kept buying annually. They really didn't even ask about month to month. Um, and that was that deals even closed a bit faster. And when I thought about it, it made a little bit more sense after, which is basically that security isn't something that's month to month, right? It's not like you're secure in November and then like all bets are off in December. Like it's a continuous thing on your own. Um, we also found that the companies that used, that were on Vanta annual contracts used the product differently. Um, they were more likely to use it as a continuous security monitoring platform or just you know, way to see that they were doing their security well versus like just preparing for a SOC 2 audit or whatever it is. Um, and there's sort of an interesting lesson for me here in that we changed the way people use the product via the way we priced for it, um, which I'm not sure I would have guessed we could do uh, in advance, but we did. Um, and then just internally, Charging annually, like just having that, uh, improved a bunch of internal things for us too. So specifically, um, it was easier for us to tell where our customer was in their life cycle. So it's easier to offer them good customer support, you know, giving them what they needed at the time they did. Um, it 
simplified RevOps uh, for fewer SKUs. So we literally just had at the time one product and one pricing option. Um, you could buy you know, Vanta for SOC 2 and you could get it annually. That was it. And so it's made all of the administration around billing or Salesforce or you know, whatever um, much simpler. Third, uh, it made our revenue a lot more predictable, um, making it less likely we'd be forced to raise to avoid some sort of cash crunch. I also think, to tie this back to lesson number one, that charging annually up front can be a really good barometer of whether you build something that people want. Um, and I say that because it takes a lot of confidence in your product to walk around and tell people they should pay for a year of it almost sight unseen. Um, but if you can pull that off, right, that's an incredibly valuable signal that you've built something that's really important to them. And ultimately, we've seen that, you know, if you're providing a valuable service, uh, customers are kind of fine with paying annually because they don't want to go renegotiate with you month after month either if you are a key piece of what they're doing. So that's lesson number two, charge annually up front. Lesson number three, hire more workhorses and spend less time searching for unicorns. So recap, first, you wanna build something people want. Second, you wanna sell it to them in a way that makes sense for them and helps you invest in your business. Uh, the next big challenge that you know, any scaling startup will face is hiring. And so the most valuable advice I can give you about recruiting is this. You just have to spend a ton of time on it. There are no silver bullets to be had here. YC told us all early on that a startup CEO should spend 50 plus percent of your time recruiting. Um, that struck me as totally unreasonable. At first, you're like, I have a million, like, do you also realize I'm, you know, the recruiter and customer success and support and, you know, and, 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 right? Like you have a million hats. Um, but I also think this is true, right? It's, it's kind of the like eat your broccoli sort of advice that you don't really wanna hear, but like is in fact accurate. Um, because if you're actually spending that much time hiring, you're not just hiring for the roles that you need, you're building a pipeline. Um, you're meeting candidates, you're meeting folks for roles you have open in the future. Um, that's really, really important and will pay off later. Um, and so that when the time comes, You'll be really glad like you met, you know, some product managers, uh, even when all you thought you needed was like a CSM or something like that. And I'd say just Vanta specifically. Um, so we've been recruiting for Vanta for about three, three and a half years at this point. Um, and three of our employees have been, were being recruited for about two of those years. Uh, and we are still courting our super intern from 2019. Um, so this is, you know, still true and we're, you know, still reaping the benefits from it. Um, literally had coffee with someone this morning who, you know, maybe will join Vanta and, you know, call it 18 months from now, but like, just, you're like constantly planting these seeds and building this pipeline. Um, so let's just say you're doing this, you're spending 50 plus percent of your time recruiting. Uh, the next piece of advice is probably also painful. Um, you're probably over-engineering what you're looking for. And I know this and say this because we fell into this trap at early Vanta. Uh, we did over-engineer what we were looking for. Um, and it was, you know, well-intentioned, like all of these things are. We were trying to grow our team of like smart, motivated people who wanted to have a big impact on the world, right? Um, and we met people that we thought were like so impressive uh, and we didn't quite have a role for them. And so we like kind of tried to like, make something for them. Um, we also thought that as a company, uh, we were very special, which we are very special, but you know, we were kind of so special that we like, you know, didn't have customer success. Uh, we had, you know, a special role called, you know, something operations, um, which, and then, you know, we tried to find someone who could fit this, you know, special role that we created. And, you know, we ended up right with these sort of unicorn roles or unicorn job descriptions. Um, and when then folks came in, like it was a, you know, customer success job. And that is great, but like we missed on, you know, setting expectations with those candidates. Um, and so there was a little bit of, you know, Instagram rea versus reality here. Um, and I think really like the idea of Ted Lasso makes for great TV, like taking someone highly specialized in Uh, and it's, you know, really funny on TV. 
I think in the context of a startup, a SaaS startup, especially in these early days, um, it's, it's, you know, not a great strategy. Um, and so when you're thinking about your early team, especially prior to getting the buzz that a, you know, big round can bring, um, it's important to pitch people on how special your startup is. But internally, it's equally important to remember all the ways your startup is just not that special. And um, it is a SaaS company. Um, and so like org describe, like innovating on org structure or job description is like probably not where you wanna be innovating, right? You should probably be innovating in your product. Um, and again, I, you know, I think we, we've course corrected here since, like literally uh, the jobs on the slide here are all things we, you know, have and had online. They're, you know, pretty standard job titles. I think they're exciting roles, but uh, you notice there's kind of fewer unicorn job titles here. Um, and so just to sum up this part around recruiting, I think you wanna uh, save time by like not, you know, engineering these really special job descriptions or these really complicated interview loops and instead spend that time going out and meeting as many people as you can for a set of roles, some of which you might need to hire for today, some of which you won't need for months. That's all okay. Just spend 50 plus percent of your time recruiting, even though that sounds unreasonable. So that's lesson number three. Lesson number four, know which problems money can and can't solve. So if you master the first three lessons, you've got a product people want, you've got a repeatable uh, go-to-market motion, and you have a kick-ass team, then you've almost certainly got you know venture capitalists chasing you down, trying to knock on your uh, Zoom door, um, trying to give you money. Uh, and that's super exciting and wonderful. My final piece of advice before, you know, signing that term sheet and like popping the champagne is to just be clear with yourself about which problems money can solve and which it can't. Um, and money can solve some problems. There are like good reasons to raise before 10 million in ARR, say. Uh, a few of them we've thought through. Competitive dynamics in your industry are changing. Capital might actually be an advantage. Um, the market otherwise is changing. Maybe there's a big player getting in, just, you know, new entrants, whatever it is. Um, you're hiring really fast and really well. Our, our sort of joke in 2020 with Vanta is like, look, we're, we'll raise as soon as we can hire faster than, uh, you know, to deplete our bank account. We were hiring as fast as we could. Um, and if you, so if you can, you know, draw down your bank account by hiring great people, like by all means do it. Um, or your marketing machine is, is printing money, right? This is one of those, you know, if you put in a dollar in the machine and $5 come out, you should, you know, put more dollars in the machine until that is less true, but truly. Um, I'd also just say that, you know, even in the Zoom financing era, when, you know, everything is back to back and over Zoom and expedited, um, financing is still a multi-week process at shortest. Um, and you'll really have to step back from your day-to-day -day responsibilities as founder or CEO in order to do it well. Um, so for me, I canceled everything on my calendar. Uh, some of this was preparing the materials, right? The data, the deck, the pitch, all of that. Some of it, honestly, was also just entering this different headspace where, you know, Vanta had no problems uh, and uh, everything was, you know, just incredible and like ready to, you know, talk to investors with the full confidence that the business deserved. Um, and then also just to say, you know, there's problems that can be solved with money. Again, there's problems that can't. Um, validating your idea or figuring out your go-to-market initially, I do not think are problems that can be solved with money. And so just if possible, would encourage you to try to figure them out before raising because it will just make your pitch stronger, right? You will just be more clear-eyed about, again, what it is you're selling, why it's valuable, who wants to buy it, and how you'll get to them. Uh, and that will be very compelling to investors. Um, and so as you've seen from our story, there are really good reasons to wait before raising money. Uh, you know, going further with your customers gives you more feedback. It gives you more discipline about building a tremendous customer experience for them that causes them to refer others. And, you know, we often celebrate the big PR moments and it's really fun to have your team's photo in Forbes or have this record sales month or week because of your financing announcement. 
But at the end of the day, I think the most important part is building the business that you want and your team wants and a business that you all are proud of. Again, if a high profile investor is proud of your business, that's great, truly, uh, but they're not in it day to day, you are. Uh, and so you and your team's kind of internal calibration here, I think it's just more important than in investors. Um, I also think you don't want to raise because of internal pressure or external pressure, sorry. Um, again, you want to do it because you have conviction in the business and the product, um, not because, you know, the hype machine tells you to and, you know, there's startups getting funded left and right, right? That's, that's for them. This is about you, what you're building and what you want to build. Um, but to that point, every startup is different. Uh, and that's part of what makes it so fun. Um, it's also what makes it so challenging. Uh, these are my four lessons uh, for building the $10 million in ARR before a Series A. First, build something people want. Second, charge annually up front if you can. Third, spend lots of time hiring, but don't over-engineer your org chart. Uh, and fourth, be realistic about what problems funding can and can't solve. Awesome. And that's what I have. Thank you so much. Thank you, Christina. Amazing. Um, that was amazing. Quick follow-up um, question. Did you raise any other money um, you know, before the Series A? Did you read, read seed, a founder's asking? Yep, we raised a couple million dollars of seed funding in the spring of 2018 and then awesome. built off of that. Thank you so much. That was really terrific. Um, we are going to share the slides and the recording with the founders after. Um, and I just really, again, thank you so much for supporting Founder U and helping us bring this amazing content to founders for free. So would love everyone to unmute themselves and, and thank Christina. <laughs> Thanks, thank Christina. You. Thank you so much. Thanks, Christina. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.